Tonight, a mass poisoning. We had to go room to room and literally bring people out and take them to the hospital. Dozens get sick from carbon monoxide at a Winnipeg motel. The life-saving response. He's been a great Secretary of Labor. President Trump should fire him. He brokered a secret plea deal over sex crimes, but he's still in Trump's cabinet. The growing pressure for Alexander Acosta to resign. Oh, get the guy. The unwelcome predator lurking in the Great Lakes. Why your pet goldfish might be hurting the environment. This is the National. More than 50 people were rescued from a Winnipeg hotel. 46 of them were hospitalized, 15 of them in critical condition poisoned by carbon monoxide. Most have now been discharged. Angela Johnston tells us what happened. It was an abrupt wake-up call for some guests at this motel. More than 50 people and a dog had to get out of this building. Leo Flett and his daughter were among them. I don't know what was going on. I was kind of scared, scared myself. <laughs> I was kind of spooked. A carbon monoxide detector went off in the boiler room around 10, 20 a.m. Dozens of people were sent to four different hospitals. Gas to the building was shut off. It's the worst imaginable feeling like all of a sudden there's when some, something bad like this happens, you don't know the extent of it. It became immediately apparent that, uh, that there was carbon monoxide present in the location. And dangerously so. The city says carbon monoxide was detected at levels up to 385 parts per million. Anything over 10 or 20 is considered dangerous. They were transported critical based on that reading and other symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, shortness of breath, uh, uh, decrease in level of consciousness. Luckily, there have been no deaths, no one in intensive care. Most patients are already out. The city's health authority says from a response point of view, everything unfolded just as it should have. When um, Winnipeg Fire and Paramedics engaged us, um, we went, uh, we were very active in working with them to ensure that patients got to the appropriate hospitals in a very timely and responsive way, and they are being treated and managed appropriately at those sites. Clearly shocked, obviously very concerned. But the sheer scale of the incident reverberated into neighboring Saskatchewan, where Manitoba's Premier is meeting other provincial and Indigenous leaders. This is, frankly, this is an incident that in my recollection, I've been around a little while, this is uh, unheard of. To see this many people impacted by uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, is, it's, it's unprecedented in my experience. Now the focus is on pinning down the cause. The motel's owner says that the building recently passed a fire inspection. Fire officials have said that a problem with the boiler unit could be to blame, but an investigation is still underway. Angela Johnston, CBC News, Winnipeg. So as it seeps into your lungs and builds up in your bloodstream, there are two things that matter with carbon monoxide poisoning. How much is in the air and then how long you're exposed. Over the course of an eight-hour workday, safety regulations in most jurisdictions recommend uh, no more than 35 parts per million. And in the hotel, fire crews recorded a concentration of more than 10 times that. That level can be deadly after just four hours of exposure. So with carbon monoxide, moments can be a matter of life and death, both in detecting the gas and responding to the consequences. Tasleem Nimji is an emergency physician. Good to see you tonight, doctor. Thank you, you as well. Okay, so how do you treat uh, carbon monoxide poisoning? I guess it depends on how bad it is, but. Well, actually the treatment is oxygen. Mm. And so with mild carbon monoxide poisoning or more severe carbon monoxide poisoning, either way, what you're trying to do is give the patient oxygen and quickly, because you're trying to displace the carbon monoxide out of the system. And, and so that would be through a mask or there's also a, a hyperbaric chamber. Would that be an extreme measure? Yes. So typically we treat with high flow oxygen nasally or through a face mask. Okay. And that's because you're trying to displace that carbon monoxide out of the red blood cells so that your body can carry oxygen instead. Um, and so if it's more severe, then we do uh, sometimes use a hyperbaric chamber. Would that be rare? 
Yes. Okay. When, when they talk about these 15 people who have a more serious case, what would be your guess about how they were being treated or how much more serious it might be? So I can't say for certain. So we measure uh, carboxyhemoglobin levels in the blood, which gives us an indication of how much carbon monoxide poisoning has occurred. Right. But really the big thing is symptoms. It's mm -hmm. how the patient presents. So patients can present with mild carbon monoxide poisoning with nausea, vomiting, muscle aches and pains. Mm -hmm. They can feel dizzy. Headache is a big one. Sure. Um, but as the symptoms become more more severe than patients can present with anything that's like a hypoxic injury, so low oxygen injury. Mm -hmm. People can be seriously confused, significantly confused. People can have seizures, uh, mm -hmm. altered mental status. And so those people, again, would be treated with oxygen, but sometimes actually have to be intubated or ventilated on a machine. Uh, and, and about long-term effects, would there be long-term effects? You know, that's a great question. So with, with mild uh, exposure, really no. Um, but with long-term exposures, then we can see the same things we would see in when there's a lack of oxygen. So people can actually have heart attacks because of the lack of oxygen. But from a long-term perspective, you can have cognitive impairment as one example that can develop. Okay, doctor, good information tonight. Thank you. Appreciate My pleasure. It. Early detection is critical here. And for an odorless, colorless gas, that means that carbon monoxide, you need to use them, carbon monoxide detectors. Katie Nicholson looked into the regulations around those life-saving devices and found some potentially fatal gaps. Here we have a, just a, a regular water heater with a burner on the bottom. And as it's burning the gas, there's actually poisonous gas that needs to make its way out of the building. Mark Guasano has more than 30 years in the HVAC business. He says large buildings like hotels use ventilation and air pressure to help move carbon monoxide out of the building. If any of that equipment fails, then there should be some monitoring um, devices that would, uh, that would uh, you know, sh either shut the equipment down or, uh, or alert somebody that there's a problem. Manitoba Hydro confirms an alarm went off in the boiler room at the Super 8. What isn't known is whether carbon monoxide alarms were installed and sounded in the hotel rooms themselves. It happened before. Two years ago, in Michigan, a malfunctioning pool heater at a Quality Inn and Suites sent 14 to hospital. One teen boy died. At the time, the local fire department said the pool room had no carbon monoxide detectors. Earlier this year, 124 children at this Montreal school became ill because of another carbon monoxide leak. There was no CO detector in the building. The rules are a patchwork across the country. Changes were made to the Manitoba Building Code in 2011 requiring carbon monoxide detectors to be installed in all hotels and motels. In 2006, Alberta's building code introduced requirements for carbon monoxide alarms in all residential buildings, including hotels. But in BC, the Vancouver Fire Department confirms there is no regulation in place requiring hotels to have carbon monoxide detectors. Back in Winnipeg, the hotel owner is relieved. We're glad that everybody's safe and evacuated the hotel. And while many people were hospitalized, there were no deaths it could have been a lot worse. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. Let's turn now to the growing questions in the U.S. about a lenient plea deal given to an American multimillionaire, Ian. Well, Rosie, Jeffrey Epstein now facing sex trafficking charges and stands accused of sexually abusing and exploiting teenage girls. But today, the scrutiny shifted from the criminal to the political. Now at the center of the scandal, Alexander Acosta, President Trump's labor secretary, and his role in the previous handling of the case. As Kim Brunhuber explains, this has politicians on both sides of the aisle pushing for answers. In negotiating an outcome... At his 2017 confirmation hearing, only one senator asked Alexander Acosta questions about his plea deal with Jeffrey Epstein. What we presented at the very, at the very beginning was two years plus registration. He was duly confirmed as Donald Trump's labor secretary. Two years later... If he refuses to resign, President Trump should fire him. That deal now has top Democrats in Congress calling for Acosta's head. Instead of prosecuting a predator and serial sex trafficker of children, Acosta chose to let him off easy. As a federal prosecutor in Miami, Acosta allowed Epstein to plead to minor charges for solicitation instead of the more serious federal charges of sex trafficking. Epstein only served 13 months in jail, much of it free on day leave. The case never went to trial, and dozens of victims who'd gone to police were never told why. 
Now that plea deal is being reviewed by the Justice Department for misconduct. Today, Acosta tweeted in his defense. With the evidence available more than a decade ago, federal prosecutors insisted that Epstein go to jail, register as a sex offender, and put the world on notice that he was a sexual predator. Now even some Republicans are asking uncomfortable questions. If this plea deal doesn't withstand scrutiny, then it would be a job of the Judiciary Committee to find out you know, how it got off the rails. Donald Trump, meanwhile, defended Acosta today, saying he felt bad for him. He's been a great, really great Secretary of Labor. Uh, the rest of it we'll have to look at. We'll have to look at it very carefully. Trump was even forced to defend his own reputation since Epstein was, at one time, a friend whom Trump called a terrific guy. I don't think I've spoken to him for 15 years. Uh, I wasn't a fan. Trump supporters say the focus of any investigation should be on Epstein, not Acosta. Democrats insist it is possible to do both. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. It was a friendly welcome for the premiers and territorial leaders in Saskatchewan. And after a two-year absence, another important voice, the Assembly of First Nations leader. Perry Bellegarde is back at the annual gathering, pressing for Indigenous voices and more inclusion. But as David Cochran tells us, there are no guarantees that he's back to stay. The government of Saskatchewan took big steps to get the premiers to Big River First Nation in part because it ensured the attendance of a big player. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. Right on, yeah. Harry Bellegarde hasn't been to one of these since 2016. The Assembly of First Nations was part of a boycott to protest the lack of time dedicated to Indigenous issues at these events. But this year is different. For the first time, provincial first ministers are meeting on a First Nation. It's never happened before in the history of Canada, so that's one reason I, I had to be here. It's a, a point in history that I think we all collectively can be uh, so very proud of as Canadians. I think it's important because uh, we want to listen uh, to him and to the uh, First Nations, uh, as many groups as possible. Bellegarde is here, but the Inuit and the Métis who joined him in the boycott are not. The Inuit say it's simply a scheduling problem, but the Métis say their concerns still have not been addressed. Not every premier made the trip to Big River either. PEI, New Brunswick, Newfoundland and Labrador and Ontario sent ministers instead. And I just want to uh, begin by welcoming uh, everyone here to, uh, to Saskatchewan. There was still a full day of discussion with lots of agreement, primarily on reducing the number of Indigenous children in care. But despite the celebration, this is really only a partial thawing in relations. Bellegarde came because this is First Nation land. He has a personal connection to its people. There's no guarantee he shows up next year. It depends who hosts it, and if it's out on First Nations territory, it would look pretty, uh, not very well for the AFN National Chief not to be out at Big River. So it depends where it's hosted next year. He's back at the table, at least for now. David Cochran, CBC News, Big River, First Nation, Saskatchewan. And here's some other stories we're following tonight on The National. A criminal investigation is underway after a violent arrest by Edmonton police. It was caught on tape and a warning. This story does contain some graphic images. The video shows officers cornering a suspect, kicking him repeatedly, slamming his head into a brick wall. The man's lawyer says his client was denied medical attention for two weeks following the arrest. After the video circulated, Edmonton police removed an officer from active duty and said it was reviewing the incident. Ontario's Transportation Minister confirming Bombardier plans to cut several hundred jobs at its Thunder Bay facility. In a statement, Caroline Mulroney said the province is disappointed with the decision and that they urge the company to work with the provincial government to come to an agreement that would see jobs remain at the Thunder Bay plant. A government source says 550 workers are expected to be laid off, half of the 1,110 who work there now. The crucifix hanging on the wall of Quebec's National Assembly was removed today. Premier Francois Legault initially campaigned for it to stay, but he changed his mind by the time his government's controversial religious symbol ban was tabled. That law now facing its first legal challenge. To exclude a group of people from public service violates the constitutional architecture. The law prohibits new government workers, such as teachers and police officers, from displaying any religious symbols on the job. 
And that's not the only debate over faith and freedom of expression in Canada tonight. A staunchly anti-abortion themed movie will soon premiere in mainstream theaters across the country. And as Deanna Sumanak Johnson explains, that's unleashed both celebration and outrage. No matter what you do for the rest of your life, you're still going to be a baby killer. The movie Unplanned has no major stars or famous directors, but it's unleashed major controversy around the country. It tells the story of Abby Johnson, a real-life employee of Planned Parenthood who rose to clinic director and then switched sides and became an anti-abortion activist after witnessing what she called a disturbing abortion. I saw it and it was like it was twisting and fighting for its life. The movie is graphic, the message is polarizing and some questioned whether it should be screened at all. It's basically, it's false propaganda. It's full of um, misstatements uh, about abortion and providers. Initially, it looked like it would never be screened. Cineplex, Canada's biggest movie chain, said it couldn't show it without a Canadian distributor. TV host and anti-abortion activist Fatine Grisetsky saw the movie at a packed special screening in Edmonton in May. She believed Canadians would want to see it. It's also giving Canadians to have an opportunity to understand what they're actually supporting when they say that they're pro-choice. If 2,800 people would have bought a ticket in the middle of the week, surely this is a moneymaker for theatres. She co-organized the petition to boycott Cineplex if it did not show unplanned. The chain eventually consented to a limited release of 14 locations. A new Brunswick pastor with a media company signed up to be its distributor with financial backing of the movie's U.S. producers. They asked, are you able to distribute this movie? And uh, I said, certainly. Uh, it lined up with you know, my, my values and uh, uh, with my faith. But with opening day getting closer, the pressure is mounting for theaters not to screen it. Already, an independent theater in Salmon Arm, B.C. canceled the film screening because its staff allegedly received threats. Pro-choice groups also worry what will happen. We're actually worried that it might increase the risk of harassment or even violence against providers in Canada. Unplanned opens in 60 theatres across Canada on Friday. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Still ahead on The National, a story of a good deed gone viral in our moment. Plus, bye-bye punch buggy, the end of the VW bug. But first, we go in-depth. Is Hong Kong's extradition bill really dead? For many there, it's all in the wording. Why can't you just come out and say the word withdrawal? <laughs> it's a very simple English word. Next, we go to Hong Kong, where protesters just aren't buying it. But first, Ross Perot has died at the age of 89 after a fight with leukemia. And plain Texas thought it's time to take out the trash and clean out the barn or it's going to be too late. Ross Perot launched a self-funded U.S. presidential bid as a plain-talking plutocrat. This is Mickey Mouse toss salad. Decades before anyone cast a ballot for Donald Trump, but Perot actually came from humble beginnings, turning a $1,000 loan into a multi-billion dollar business. Now, I can't compete with some of these other entertainment shows, but please, stay with me on this program tonight. And his 1992 presidential bid was visionary for the time, making his pitch directly to voters with his own TV segments and on talk shows. Here comes H. Ross Perot, right here. Forcing the establishment yes. to respond. Yes. Now I will be glad to respond to questions. I think, Terry, I think you have the first. Mr. President, I'd like to ask you about Ross Perot. Does anybody have a significant question? Or is this going to be the usual mindless press conference? If it is, I'm going to bed. He was a big personality and a big target for late night comedy. If I got you a gift, I'd bring you candy. I wouldn't bring you a bowl full of flies. See, I've got a theme song for our campaign. And here it comes. Just listen to it. We're crazy. But Perot remains the most successful U.S. third-party candidate in more than a century, and he paved the way for outsider campaigns to come. Carrie Lam's a liar. I mean, this morning, she's uh, still trying to use political rhetoric, her playing with words.
No trust and no backing down after Hong Kong leader Carrie Lam declared the divisive extradition bill there dead. Her opponents are demanding more. Specifically, they want it in writing, formally withdrawn from the legislature. And as Sasha Petrasik explains, they also want her to pay a price for letting it all go this far at all. <laughs> In protest after protest, as millions marched, it's been clear they don't trust Hong Kong leader Carrie Lam and her Beijing-backed government. I don't believe her. They don't accept her apologies and don't believe it when she's promised to shelve a bill that would allow Hong Kongers to be extradited to China to face trial. She would definitely push forward this uh, wicked bill. So when Lam acknowledged the problem on Tuesday... There are still lingering doubts about the government's sincerity. Her declaration seemed like a clear win for protesters and pro-democracy lawmakers. The bill is dead. Turns out that's just not good enough for many. Protesters want the bill officially withdrawn, a term that's legally binding not just declared dead. So if you can say that, why can't you just come out and say the word withdrawal? <laughs> it's a very simple English word. Besides, it would be politically impossible to go ahead with this bill now, risking an even bigger public backlash. On the street, beyond the distrust, there's also disappointment, even anger. Lam refused to call an independent inquiry into alleged police brutality, the kind of action used to clear roads at the end of last weekend's mostly peaceful protest. She also rejected calls for her resignation. We urge her to step down, to pay her political price and penalty. She should step down instead of asking, urging Hong Kong people to give her a second chance. Sasha is in Hong Kong again, where it is already Wednesday morning. So, Sasha, going forward from here, will Lamb's words change anything on the ground there? Well, Rosemary, if anything, it seems as though it has re-energized the uh, protest movement here. Uh, people are even angrier and more determined to go out onto the streets. There are at least two protests planned in different parts of Hong Kong for this weekend. Certainly not the quick fix that uh, Carrie Lam might have hoped for in ending this political crisis, which has already gone on for a long time. As for the government side, uh, the legislature here is being uh, repaired after protests and vandalism last week. It's likely not going to be ready for anything until October. Rosemary? Okay. Thanks for this again tonight, Sasha. Joining me now in studio, Lynette Ong, Associate Professor of Political Science at the Asian Institute uh, at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, and Andrea Chun. She's a Hong Kong Canadian lawyer, political commentator, and radio host. Good to see you both here today. I, I want to start with sort of the, the, the issue that has been hard for uh, non-Cantonese-speaking uh, people to understand around the language that was used by Carrie Lam, that the bill is dead. Uh, but not, I guess, withdrawn. Should we read anything into the way she explained this? Uh, I'll start with you, Lynn. I think naturally people will speculate whether the bill is really dead, suspended, or really withdrawn. Because generally, I think people just mistrust her, her government. Um, yeah. She's seen as a puppet of Beijing authorities. I think that is kind of expected. Uh, my sense is I think the bill is dead for now. Um, in the near future, it's difficult to um, rule out that it might be resuscitated or, you know, tightening of political control overall in Hong Kong. It does seem, though, well, I mean, I, this is coming from a Western perspective, but it does seem like it would be political suicide for her to try and reintroduce it. Is that the wrong reading of that? I'm not sure whether there's any type of political suicide since she's really not elected by the people. Yes. So, um, and she's really accountable mostly to Beijing. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, I think the language here, um, shall we spend a lot of time dwelling on it? Because uh, the translation might be lost that it was a natural death as opposed to she killed it. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is, if it is dead for now, as Lynette says, even if she promises to withdraw, what does that really mean? Does that mean future governments cannot reintroduce any type of form or a similar version of it? So to me, I think the discussion should move on, although the protesters are not happy with what she just said. So d should the protesters declare a victory of sorts here? 
You know, it really depends on how you define victory. So I think the more immediate demand is uh, putting this um, extradition bill out of fire. Yeah. But I think there is overall an underlying concern that uh, you know there's e a lot of economic grievances, huge income inequality in Hong Kong, uh, a lot of young people priced out of rising housing market. As I think all those things are actually not not addressed, mm. coupled with erosion of the rule of law, uh, political issue, lack of political freedom, yes. and all those things under threat. So the very uniqueness of Hong Kong, yes. I think, is under threat. And I think those is not. I, I don't think the protesters have been successful on those fronts. No. No, just immediately on the extradition bill. So do we see then as a reaction or response to this encroachment by China in, into Hong Kong uh, that the protests would continue, that there would be an ongoing sort of rebellion in the streets? I think the movement would definitely continue, whether it's by way of an further mass protests or other forms, because there are upcoming elections, whether it's local elections or other elections. There have been um, legislators who have been disqualified. They're still calling for the charges to be dropped against those uh, what they call alleged rioters, what I call yes. peaceful protesters, yes. or just isolated incidents of uh, violence. Carrie Lam is not going to quit anytime soon, although mm. that's one of their demands. So I think, by and large, it's percolated to the, to the point where um, I think Beijing would be concerned with the, the uh, number of people who are out there yes. and the international uh, scrutiny. Mm. So we've got all fronts and the national um, focus and attention on this. Does, does that then pose problems for China's relationship with Taiwan? Does it then, does Taiwan then look at what's happening in Hong Kong and say, oh, this is how we push back against China and make sure we preserve our independence? I'm sure, you know, people in Taiwan are watching the situation in Hong Kong very closely because the model of one country, two system is supposed to be applied to Taiwan. Yeah. I think what is happening is it is hardening the people, the DPP camp, because they are going to the, the pro uh, democracy camp. Yes. They are going to point at the situation in Hong Kong, saying that there's no way that we want this one country two system to, to be applied to yes. us. But I think what is also happening is there are going to be some conservative people pro Kuomintang, pro reunification. They are going to point at the chaos in Hong Kong, mm. saying that you know, look at this is how this is what happens to give young people democracy. Right. Uh, you never want to do that, and right. and therefore you want to return to 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 China's rule. So so it I think could things, go both ways. Right. So yeah. I think things in Taiwan are are getting more polarized. Uh, it, through this, Canada has said a little bit uh, as the protests were in the streets. What what. What, what should they make of the situation now, given that Canada is currently in this ongoing, extremely tense relationship with China? Andrea? I think Canada is in a very, very tight spot. spot. I, said, I think as an international citizen, we should speak out against any violation of human rights. Sure. Um, and certainly, Mr. Trudeau probably has raised it with China. Having said that, they've got two Canadians uh, locked up now, where they're exerting economic pressure. Given what is happening with our relationship with China, I think um, not much might be able to be achieved by speaking to them. And we were, I, I saw how they sat next to each other at the G20, yes. and they weren't even talking to each yeah. other. So I think at this point, uh, Canada might have to be a bit more pragmatic, pragmatic and, and worry about the two Canadians who... They, they did speak off to the side in, in quiet moments when they, when they could. But Lynette, would you agree that this isn't really something we should be getting involved in? I think our priorities should be to secure the release of the two Michaels as soon as possible. I mean, what is happening in Hong Kong, I think, is every Everyone's interest, particularly, particularly those of the demo of, of democracies, to see you know freedom and, and rule of law return to Hong Kong. Yeah. But I think, but I think our immediate foreign pri uh, pr uh, policy priorities is really um, Canadians who are in Beijing. Okay, Andrea, Lynette, good of you to come in. Appreciate your perspectives tonight. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Still ahead on The National, in case you missed it, meet your new King of the North. Vladdy Jr. takes center stage, breaking some major league records. Oh my gosh, how quickly we move on. And <laughs> former pets, now pests or worse. All right, who did it? Who released their goldfish? What are they doing in the harbor? These are meant to be in a fish bowl. So that's pretty nuts. Giant goldfish taking over Canada's waterways. That's next.
It is 1036 Mountain Time, and we're following some breaking news tonight on The National. Emmy Award-winning actor Rip Torn has died. What is that? I don't know, but as soon as I finish this salty dog, I'm going to rip that camera from his hands and tear him a new a hole. All right. There he was, his talk show producer, Artie, on The Larry Sanders Show, one of his most famous roles. The Texas native enjoyed an over seven-decade career, ranging from the Broadway stage to starring in Hollywood blockbusters like Men in Black. Rip Torn was 88 years old. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency is recalling Eat Smart Sweet Kale Vegetable Salad Kits. The salad could be contaminated with listeria. Officials say it may not look or smell spoiled, but could still make you very ill. This recall applies to kits sold across Atlantic Canada, Ontario, and Quebec. Residents and others uh, in British Columbia's central interior are dealing with severe flooding tonight. Swollen rivers and creeks caused major damage. The area has seen more than 100 millimeters of rain in the past five days. The River Forecast Center says the region hasn't seen flooding like this in 200 years. Well, they're an easy first pet, a popular ornamental fish, a calming presence in dentist offices. But if goldfish are discarded in the wrong way, they can grow into destructive, well, monsters. Parts of Lake Ontario are filled with them, so researchers have launched a unique catch and release operation in hopes of getting the upper hand. Cass Rusi shows us how. We started tagging goldfish in 2017. Near Hamilton, Ontario, aquatic research biologist Christine Boston and her team Yay. are on a mission. Oh, get the guy. A mission to rid the waters of an unwanted and unwelcomed predator. Goldfish. My, what? <laughs> and not the tiny orange colored variety in aquariums. What are they doing in the harbor? These are meant to be in a fishbowl. Um, these fish are getting into the harbor uh, <laughs> either through um, active release, people are releasing their pets into the harbor, or they're getting into the harbor, I think, through um, people's private ponds or stormwater management ponds. So why are they so big? I don't remember goldfish uh, being that big. Uh, I think they just, they have the resources. They have an unlimited supply of food here in the harbor for them. That's good for the goldfish, which are not only surviving, but thriving. It's doing well and our native fish aren't doing well. Uh, it competes uh, for the habitat that our fish need um, to spawn and reproduce. It, they generate a lot of um, turbidity in the water, which uh, decreases the water quality. Can you grab the forceps and pull that out for me? Christine and her team want to learn more about goldfish. Got it? Yep. So they're using something called acoustic telemetry that will help track and monitor their movement. So this tag is a transmitter. It should last three to five years. It's going to emit a, a sound, like a, a pulse, every three to five minutes. Um, it has a depth sensor on it, so we can tell what depth the fish is at um, at any time when this fish is swimming in the vicinity of one of our uh, receivers. The team works swiftly, trying to minimize the stress on the fish. Goldfish are considered destructive, and not much is known about them. There we go. The team is hopeful their work will shed some light on their behavior. Now scientists at the University of Nevada are finding them by the hundreds in Lake Tahoe, and they are monsters, guys. Okay, maybe they're Around the globe, yeah. goldfish are invading lakes and ponds. All right, who did it? Who released their goldfish? Anglers even capturing monster-sized fish. Huge goldfish. Some lakes even shutting down fishing because of goldfish infestations. So this is Coots Paradise. So this is the harbors just on the other side of the uh, the fishway over here, which you'll see. So Coots Paradise. Ecologist Kyle Mattia has also noticed a spike in the goldfish population. Pull them right up to the so they can get out of the step as tight as we can get to the front. Kyle and his team work to keep the common carp out of this nature reserve. The carp is an invasive fish and destroys habitat and precious spawning grounds. So with the help of this multi-million dollar fish barrier, 
The carp are diverted, and that's helped decrease their population by more than half. But at the same time, Kyle says there's been an explosion of goldfish. What do you figure is the cause for this spike in goldfish? It's tough to say exactly. Um, I know even ourselves, we're, we're kind of puzzled as to why, you know, the goldfish are, are coming up in such high numbers as they are. The goldfish may be filling that niche where the carp have been removed from. Lovable pet or undesirable pest. Whatever the reasons for the goldfish boom, scientists have one singular message. Don't flush your pet goldfish down the toilet and don't discard them in lakes and ponds. They're competing with our native species. And right now, there's an imbalance in the system. Yeah. We don't have enough of these native fishes that, that we need to have to have in a healthy ecosystem. And, uh, but for the good of science, these tagged goldfish are allowed to return to the waters, providing valuable data that could one day help restore these wetlands. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Hamilton. Honestly, who knew, right? Next on The National, an Ontario inventor wants you to rethink your recycling. See, plastic isn't the problem. In fact, our problem is our view of plastic. We think plastic is garbage. His fix for all that plastic we throw away, but first. After eight decades, a world war, a cold war, and a pile of Herbie movies, Volkswagen is ending the Beetle again. It's ironic that one of history's most popular cars was willed into being by one of its worst dictators. Ordered by Hitler as an affordable people's car, the first Beetle rolled off the line in Nazi Germany back in 1938. But few remembered that connection after the war. The Beetle seemed to symbolize peace and adventure. Cheap, reliable, and fun to drive, it was incredibly popular, especially with young people. From 1950 to 1979, tens of millions were built until the company phased it out. More than 19 million have been built. But today at a plant in the town of Emden, the last beetle made in West Germany rolled off the assembly line. But nostalgia dies hard, and VW reads tea leaves well. In 1998, it reintroduced a newer, more muscular beetle. It too had a good run, but never fully recaptured the magic, probably because really it was just a golf with a bubble-shaped top. Yeah, I said it. And now, with sagging sales, Volkswagen is killing it again. The last production line in Mexico wraps up this week. I'm Jamie Poisson. Tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, a feature interview with Foreign Affairs Minister Christian Freeland about Ukraine, Venezuela, and why releasing Meng Wanzhou would be a mistake. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Canada has a plastic problem. This country throws away 3 million tons of it a year. The vast majority heads to landfills and incinerators or litters the planet like this load, which wound up in Malaysia. The federal government plans to ban the single-use variety by 2021, but an Ontario-based inventor has come up with another solution, one that makes it easy to recycle and repurpose plastic waste close to home. Diane Buckner got a preview. So here, what we've got, as an example, we have taken and chopped up waste plastic. So this is 100% chopped up pieces of plastic. Ever wonder what happens to kids who win the Canada-wide science fair? And that chopped up plastic with our special extruder can actually make it into good molten product again. In Wayne Conrad's case, that victory at age 13 has led to a career as a little-known but prolific inventor. See, plastic isn't the problem. In fact, our problem is our view of plastic. We think plastic is garbage. His latest innovation, a small, energy-efficient machine that melts down plastic to turn it into siding, furniture and other products. There are already machines that do that, but they cost millions and are the size of a tractor trailer. What it's going to do is enable entrepreneurs, small and large, and big companies to say, hey, 
My municipal waste stream is a source of raw materials. This isn't Conrad's first crack at a big idea. How many patents do you have? Um, five or six hundred granted patents now. And five or six hundred? Yeah. One is used in the water filtration system on the International Space Station. Others are related to the big-selling Shark Ninja line of vacuum cleaners. So we went to them and said, hey, we've got some neat vacuum cleaner innovations. Would you like to talk to us? Nowadays, Conrad is focusing his ingenuity on the problem of plastic. But can his invention make a difference? First of all, to make sure that we collect as much uh, of the plastic as, as possible. The plastic specialist at Environmental Defense isn't convinced. That kind of innovation is useful to uh, reduce the problem, but it doesn't reduce the plastic, so it, at, at source. Conrad argues less plastic will need to be made if we get more use from what already exists. His staff of 50 are already turning plastic waste into roofing material for use in Haiti. And he's invested in a new manufacturing facility. I can turn this into a good product, like the paving stones here, and it lasts for 20 to 25 years. And then at the end, I can take it back, grind it up, add some things to it, and use it again for another 25 years. That is actually the perfect example. He has secrets in his workshop he won't show off just yet, but almost all are aimed at a more sustainable future. He keeps this up. His science fair trophy could be one of a collection of prizes. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Hampton, Ontario. I want to know what those secrets are. Still ahead, a missed bus and a random act of kindness connect two strangers in Halifax, one with a tragic past. I was shocked when I learned that it was her in, in the front seat of my car. I had seen her on the news many times, a whole family um, story on the news. The chance encounter being shared online. The lesson this woman hopes we learn from it in our moment. But first, in case you missed it, Kawhi who? Toronto sports fans may have a new king of the north. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Yes, all hail Vlad Guerrero Jr., the Blue Jays rookie who put on an electric performance at last night's MLB Home Run Derby in Cleveland. We could be watching history tonight in Cleveland, boys and girls. Oh my goodness. The 20-year-old hit a total of 91 home runs over three rounds, so he broke the single round record and then he broke the derby total record. While it wasn't quite enough to win that million dollar first prize, Vladdy Jr. was the star of the show. Hey, I was just trying to put a great show for everyone. I really enjoy it. I mean, I did the best I could. I didn't win, but oil, you know, it's all good. We will always have that Kawhi Game 7 buzzer beater. Game Series! And a championship win, but Toronto, maybe it's time to move on. And it looks like the city may have found the best kind of rebound. Halifax woman's split-second decision to help another woman has turned into a lesson for everyone about kindness and how you never know whose path you might cross right when they most need a little bit of help. Casey Lee Martin was sitting at a red light on Sunday when she saw a woman and two kids racing for a city bus, but just before they reached it, it pulled away. And when Martin turned around to offer them a ride, she had no idea who that woman was until her story started to spill out. That's our moment tonight. As a mom, I have had to take the bus with my children before, so I really felt uh, for the lady. The woman said they were going to the hospital to visit her husband in the ICU. It was Martin's first hint at her passenger's identity. I learned that the children in my backseat weren't hers, um, as her children had died in a house fire five months prior. 